Please turn to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter, or not 11, Acts chapter number 12. Acts chapter 12, if you would please. And you can remain seated tonight. And uh, so we'll go through and do this Bible study. Acts chapter number 12. I'm going to talk to you tonight, and uh, in our study through the book of Acts, is on the power of of prayer. How many of you believe in prayer? Okay. How many believe that God answers prayer? 
Okay, amen. And we could see we could see a lot of that uh, take place. We could see a lot of that take place in the life of uh, those that we've seen in the Bible. And a lot of times we think, boy, I, I wonder if we serve that same God. And uh, we may not ask that question outright. And uh, but a lot of times in our mind, you know, it, uh, boy, they they had their prayers answered. They just got to see all of this. You know, well, what if somebody was writing a book about our life? And uh, maybe a Bible about our life. What, what would they see the same faith that these people had uh, in the prayers and the, and the power that was there? If you would, uh, let's look at uh, starting at verse number one. We'll read just down a few verses. It says this. It says, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Uh, what, are, what are they talking about? What about that time? And uh, it was about that time we talked about last week when, when Agabus uh, comes and talks about how when uh, Claudius Caesar is going to be in charge, that there's going to be a famine uh, that is coming, some of the end time things that are, that are coming. And uh, as Dr. Luke is writing uh, this, uh, he said right about that same time that, that, that the church was, was uh, getting together there uh, in Antioch and they, they uh, took a... a um, an offering together, and they sent it down to the uh, to the folks there at Jerusalem. Right in in this time, right about that same time frame, uh, some other things that were going on in the country. It says that Herod uh, stretched forth his hand uh, to uh, 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 vex the certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, uh, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And then in parentheses, at least in my Bible, says, then were the days of unleavened bread or uh, the Passover. And when he had apprehended him, he put him into prison and delivered him uh, to four quintinians of soldiers. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth uh, to the people. Why is that? Well, the Jewish uh, days of unleavened bread were taking place. It was a seven-day Passover celebration. He didn't want to uh, do anything during that time, and uh, Herod didn't, because after all, he was trying to gain the favor uh, of the Jews, and so he just put him into prison and, and had some people watching him and uh, in that. And so uh, let's talk just a little bit uh, about that and get this table set for what we're going to see play out in chapter uh, number 12. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your loving goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the word of God that teaches us many lessons. And I pray that today, Lord, that we would learn the lesson, Lord, that there is power in prayer and that a church needs to pray for, uh, for one another Lord, and uh, they need to bind together with one another. Lord, uh, we don't need to be talking about each other, Lord, and uh, to other folks, but Lord, we need to be talking to you about specific things, Lord, getting answers from you and uh, getting guidance from you. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to, to do that. We would learn that lesson, Lord, here uh, tonight, Lord, as we see the power of a praying church uh, help to uh, uh, set free, Lord, one of your servants. We ask this in your precious name, amen. Now, as we come to Acts chapter number 12, we are now ten, nearly 10 years past the day of Pentecost. The church has been growing uh, there in Jerusalem uh, for, for 10 years. And uh, the persecution, uh, the church has weathered the persecution of the Jewish uh, leaders, the uh, religious leaders. And now Luke records that persecution uh, was now coming from the ruling authority there in Palestine, not necessarily uh, from the Sadducees and from the Pharisees, not that they were, were against it, but, uh, uh, but now uh, some of the, um, the ruling class was. Now Herod, in this, pass, in this passage, was the grandson of Herod the Great, who was ruler when Jesus Christ was born. So Herod is more of a title uh, that they have uh, for themselves. And so you have Herod the Great, and uh, he had a son by the name of Astrobulus, and, uh, uh, and he was the father of, of, of Herod Agrippa. So you have Herod the Great, you have his son, Astrobulus, who, by the way, was executed in 7 B.C., his father executed two, one of his sons and executed one of his wives as his favorite or his first wife because he thought that they were trying to overthrow him uh, for the throne. And so uh, when, uh, this, uh, when, when his father was, was executed, his son, uh, Agrippa I, 
was moved to Rome to live. And while he was living in Rome, uh, he became intimate friends with the members of the imperial family uh, there in Rome, especially someone by the name of Gaius, who was the grand nephew of the emperor at the time, Tiberius. So in AD 37, Gaius succeeded Tiberius as emperor, and due to their longtime friendship, Gaius then appoints uh, Agrippa I as tetrarch, uh, which was a governor over a fourth part of a providence uh, or a, uh, a subordinate prince, so to speak, uh, over some lands there in Palestine. So he moves him from Rome back into this area. And so in the northern areas, right around what we would call Syria now, he becomes the tetrarch or he becomes the governor. And uh, because his friend is, uh, has, has become the uh, the emperor at the time. And so he, he's in charge of Philip and uh, Licinius. And then, uh, and from there, he decided to give himself the title of king. And uh, he did, just didn't want to be a prince. He wanted to be a king. After all, he could do that uh, in that. So now you have uh, King Herod Agrippa uh, I uh, that is there. And uh, some two years later, Galilee and, uh, and, and Puria uh, were added to his kingdom when his uncle Herod Antipas was deposed by Emperor uh, Gaius. Now, who was he? Well, Agrippa I's sister, Herodias, was married to Herod Antipas, who uh, was the one that had John the Baptist beheaded and, uh, in that. And so you, you see this family had some, wielded some power, but whatever uh, Antipas did, he had, his, he had his title stripped, and it was given to uh, Gaius's friend. Now, however, Agrippa's kingdom was then even further enhanced to the addition of Judea, which is this area uh, where, the, where a lot of the stuff in the Bible took place, Jerusalem, all, all of that area. And, uh, and so he was coming into uh, his own there, uh, there in A.D. 41. So uh, he was alive during the time of when Jesus was uh, doing his ministry. I'm sure that he, heard, he had heard of the crucifixion. He had watched the growth of the church. And, uh, and so now... Uh, he was in charge. Then, upon the assassination of Gaius, Claudius uh, is now about to become the Roman emperor. And so, uh, because this Agrippa I was part of the royal family, the Hasmonean royal family, uh, via his, uh, uh, his, his great-grandfather, Herod, uh, Herod the Great, and his first wife, uh, his grandmother, Marmony, uh, she was a Hasmonean princess. He enjoyed unusual popularity, therefore, amongst the, the ruling class of the Jews or the religious class of the Jews. They, they liked him. And, uh, and so he wanted to continue to gain favor with them. It's not surprising uh, then that he moved against the Christians and started to persecute them in order to please the Jewish leaders who opposed them. You've got all that straightened out now, who everybody is. Are you guys all like going, I hated history class. Why are you teaching us history? Because I think it's important. A lot of times we read in the Bible and we see these people, we don't study out who they are. And it's important to understand the thought process that, that these people had. And so just out of nowhere, he decides that now that, that, now that he is in charge of the Judean area and uh, he is going to make a show. And so uh, he, he goes... And in our scripture reading, it says about the time that uh, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex. That word vex there in verse number one means to injure or harm certain of the church. His intent was to win the Jewish religious leaders over by bringing harm to the Christian church leaders. And so he picks one out and he picks James. It doesn't tell us why. James was the brother of John. Not John the Baptist, the brother of John, son of, of Zebedee. As you study in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus was, was picking his disciples, he, he found Andrew and Peter and then James and John. They were fishing buddies together. They were fishing partners uh, up there in, in, in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, they were handpicked. And for some reason, he, he, he finds him and he beheads him, takes his head off of him. And then you see uh, in verse number three, it says, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded further to take Peter also. Why pick Peter? Peter was a big fish, wasn't he? I mean, Peter was basically, if you think about it, Peter was the head of the church. And so he says, hey, he says, if they were happy that I, I took care of a, a small fry in James, 
Because you don't hear a whole lot about James. What are they going to do when I arrest Peter and then I make a big show out of killing him? That's how these guys thought. That was their, pro, their thought process uh, in that. I remember my Bible history teacher telling us in, in this area of the country, if you wanted to be king, all you had to do was kill the king. Simple enough, you know, and, uh, and, and you could do that. And so uh, this was the thought process that these, these folks had. And so uh, he takes Peter and he tosses him in jail. Now, this isn't the first time Peter's been in jail. In Acts chapter number four, him and John were spent overnight in jail waiting to be tried on healing uh, a man of, of the palsy. And, uh, and then in chapter number five, they're thrown in jail again because the first time they told him, don't preach in the name of Jesus. What did they do? They went right back out and preached in the name of Jesus. And so here you have Peter and uh, he is in jail. Now, Peter, some years later in his epistle uh, of First Peter, uh, I think wrote a little bit about the experience. And he quoted from Psalm chapter 34, verses 15 and 16. But this is what he wrote in First Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. He wrote these words. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But his face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now I want to take this, this verse from 1 Peter and break it down in, in what we're going to see in this chapter. And I believe that there are four wonderful assurances that God gives us from this chapter through this verse that we can have when we have difficult days. Anybody have difficult days in their life? Sure, all of us do. We have struggles and, uh, in that. And so the first thing that we see here is that God sees our trials. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and, uh, uh, verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Now God watched and noted that King Agrippa, or what King Agrippa was doing to his people. It was no surprise. God sees when, when we are in trouble. Now, could God prevent us from being in trouble? Sure he could. But sometimes he allows trouble to come into our lives to, to mature us or to, uh, to help us to grow. Now, here King Agrippa had several people uh, arrested, among whom was James, the brother of John. James was an apostle. He was kind of a big catch, so he had him beheaded. Now, James was the first of the apostles to be martyred. When you ponder the, his death in the light of, of Matthew chapter 20, go ahead, let's turn to Matthew chapter 20. When you think about it, uh, it's not that he asked for it, but he asked for it uh, in that. And so maybe this is why the Lord allowed him to, to be taken. In Matthew chapter 20 and in verse number 20, it says this. Then came, uh, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. So mama came and she's got James and John in towed worshiping him, worshiping Jesus, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? And she said unto him, grant that these, uh, grant that these my two sons may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what that ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with. And notice, mom doesn't answer. James and John answer. And they said, and they said unto him, we are able. Hey, whatever you go through, Lord, we're going to be able to go through with you. Well, Jesus answers them back and says this. And he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed from my cup and be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given uh, to them for whom it is repaired of uh, the Father. And so you had them ask for that. They, they said, hey, can, can we go through that? And they said, yes, we're going to be able to do that. Are, we gonna, are you going to be able to drink from that cup? Now, of course, we don't know. Uh, they didn't know what they were saying, but eventually they would discover the high cost of uh, of asking for a throne of glory. James was arrested and he was beheaded. And John became ex, an exile on Patmos, a prisoner of Rome. And according to the book of Revelations, indeed they did drink from the same cup of baptism and shared in the baptism of suffering that the Lord had experienced. 
Now, the Lord allowed this to happen. You know what? Sometimes bad things happen to good people. We don't understand it. Could, could Jesus Christ, could God have kept James from being beheaded? Absolutely. But he let it go through. God always has his reason, even if we don't understand it on this side of glory. So God permitted Herod then to arrest Peter and to place him under heavy guard. He must have caught wind that uh, the second time Peter was in jail, that he was let out. And uh, he just walked right, right out of jail. The angel of the Lord came in and, and took care uh, of that. Now Herod saw that the delight it was for the Jews uh, to see him kill a top level uh, church leader and, the, uh, uh, and an apostle of Jesus. So he goes after a bigger catch. He has Peter uh, arrested just before Passover and plans to execute him after the days of unleavened bread, which lasted for seven days, or for the Christian Easter, as it, as it is said. And it tells us that he wanted to ensure that Peter was going to stay in jail. And, uh, and so it, it tells us in verse number four that he placed him under four quant, uh, quantarians of soldiers. That was 16 soldiers, four for each watch. In other words, at, at all times, Peter was being watched by at least four guards. As you will uh, see, uh, turn back to, uh, uh, to chapter number 12. As you see, uh, the way that it worked is that um, uh, in verse number six, or look at verse, verse number uh, five, it says, therefore he was kept in prison, but, uh, but prayer was made without ceasing unto the church, unto God for him. And Herod, who had brought him forth, uh, that same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains and uh, keepers before the door and kept prison. So in other words, I was trying to explain this uh, to my grandson today. Uh, uh, he was sleeping between two prison guards, literally chained to two Roman guards. And then there were two other people that had a watch that watched the door that he was at. So four Roman soldiers watching him and, uh, and they would have to watch them for four hours each. So they had to go through the watch uh, that was there. And so uh, he, was, he was very well, or as Herod thought, taken care of. Now we ask the question, why was James allowed to die and Peter to eventually be rescued? Both men were dedicated servants of God. Uh, they needed, uh, needed by the church. The only answer is that, a so, uh, is that the sovereign will of God uh, uh, is the very thing that the, that the apostles had prayed about during their second experience in church. In, in Acts chapter number four, they prayed that no matter what, that God would give them uh, the, the intestinal fortitude to follow his will. God allowed James uh, to be killed, but kept Herod from harming Peter. Make no mistake about it. It is, was the throne of heaven that was in control, not the throne on earth that was taking care of this. So we see, not only does God uh, uh, see, uh, uh, see our need, but God also, we see, hears our prayers. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, and his ears are open unto our prayers. Now notice the phrase there in verse number five, but prayer. Now, this is the turning point of the story. Things don't look good for Peter. They, they really don't. They don't look good for Peter. They don't look good for the church, but prayer. Now, uh, never underestimate the power of a praying church. A Puritan preacher by the name of uh, uh, Thomas Watson said this, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. If you want something, to, if you want God to make a difference in somebody's life, gossiping about that is not gonna change it. I remember we used to sing this song, you, uh, um, oh, it just went out of my mind. But one of the phrases was, you could talk about me as much as you please, I'll just talk about you down on my knees. All my sins have washed away, I've been redeemed, was the name of the song. We could be more effective in praying for somebody than talking about somebody. The church didn't gather and start saying, oh, did you hear that Peter was arrested? I wonder what he did this time. He's been in jail, this is his third time. Surely he, he had to have done something wrong. I mean, after all, I mean, listen to the messages that he preaches and you can just go on and on and on. 
And a lot of times that's what we do when, 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 when bad things happen to good people. The first thing we do is, what did they do wrong? Instead of, hey, maybe God's taking th- them to, through a trial and maybe we need to be doing talking from right here. I, I hear people saying, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But how much do we really do it? How much do we really do it? Here the church, it said, it says, but prayer. Look, look at what it says here in verse number five. But prayer was made, what? Without ceasing, where? Of the church unto God. For who? For Peter. God, Peter's in trouble. It doesn't look good for Peter. Lord, if it be your will, deliver Peter out of prison. People weren't having a gossip session about it. They were praying for him. And that's what's important. That's what, what, what was needed. That's what needed to be done. So let's look at Peter. In verse number six, it says that he was, uh, yeah, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Let me ask you a question. If you were chained between two prison guards, how much, how soundly would you sleep? I mean, just think about it. You're going to see here in just a minute, Peter was, wasn't just sleeping. He was sleeping. Because the angel of the Lord came in with a bright light. That didn't wake him up. He had to smote him on his side to get him up. It's like trying to get your kids up for school tomorrow. I guarantee you, watch as we, as we read down through here. Let's look at it. It says this. Oh, before we get there, let, let me tell you something. This wasn't Peter's first stint in prison or in jail, but it was very different than the previous two times. Let me tell you why. Four things. Number one, this time he was alone. He didn't have the other apostles with him. He was all by himself. It was just Peter this time. John wasn't with him. None of the other disciples were with him. He was in there by himself. Number two, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't in prison uh, after, uh, he wasn't in prison this time after a great witnessing victory, but after the death of a very dear friend and brother in Christ. Previous two times, Miracles had happened and, and, and a great revival was taking place. But this time it was right after the death of a friend. So it was, it was different. He was not uh, delivered this time right away like he was the first two times. I mean, immediately he got out of jail the other two times. Just after a few hours, but this time it seemed like days were going by. And then lastly, this time he was facing certain death. Make no mistake about it, he was probably counting down the time. But the one thing that you see about it is he just really wasn't worried about it because he was asleep. What gave him so much confidence? Let's look at it. Uh, uh, Look at verse number seven. And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind thy sandals. And, he, and so he did. And he, and, he ha, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And when he went out, he followed him. And wist not if it was true which was done by the angel, but he thought that he saw a vision. And when he had passed the first and second ward, they, uh, they came to an iron gate that leadeth to the city, which opened unto them of his own accord and they went excuse me out and passed through uh, one street and forthwith the angel departed from him and verse number 11 says and Peter came uh, uh, and when Peter was come to himself he said now I know surely that the Lord has sent his angel to deliver me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews I mean Peter was just just asleep what gave him the confidence to just be sleeping? Well, many, many people were earnestly praying for him. It gave him confidence because he knew that the church was praying for him. Prayer has a, a way of reminding us of our promises that God makes to us. Uh, listen to what it tells us in a couple of passages of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 tell us this. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer... And supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. 
And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Peter said, hey, people are praying. I've been arrested. There's not a whole lot I can do about it. I might as well get some sleep. And he slept. Psalm chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only maketh me to dwell in safety. He said, you know what? God's got all, all in control. Whether I'm here tomorrow or not, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to put it in God's hands. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says this, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Or perhaps he just remembered the promise of the Savior. In the book of John, chapter 21, when after, after Jesus talks to him and asks him three times, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter answered, yea, Lord, I love thee. And then Jesus tells him something. He says this. He says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither, there, whither thou wouldest not. This he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. I believe that Peter was just simply uh, claimed that promise and committed his entire situation to the Lord. He said, hey, Lord said, when I'm old, how old is old? I used to think when I'm my age now, I was old. Now I don't think I'm so old. I look at other people and say, why, they're more mature than I am. And uh, in more ways than one. And uh, in that. And, uh, but here, I believe that he just, he just sat back and rested in God's promise. He didn't know how and he didn't know when God would deliver him or if he would. But he knew that somehow some type of deliverance was coming. Whether he was going to be free to go on and preach or whether God was going to free him from this sin-cursed world and take him to heaven. He just didn't worry about it. He just, he slept. Then we see that Peter was obeying. We see once again the ministry of an angel, the angels, and, remind, and we are reminded that their angels care for God's children. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 7 says this, The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivered them. The angel brought light and liberty into the prison, but the guards had no idea what was going on. I mean, I, I have no idea what the guards were doing. They were there, and it wasn't just the guards right around his cell. There were other guards within that prison. There were other prisoners that were there. But here the angel Lord came right on in, and, uh, and his glorious light was there shining. The angel literally had to wake Peter up from a sound sleep. He smote him on his side and, and, uh, and, and roused him and or raised him. He had to arouse him. He said, hey, get up. The angel gave uh, Peter specific instructions what to follow, uh, uh, and it was up to Peter to obey. I mean, honestly, you know, Peter, get up. Put your clothes on. Get your shoes on. Grab your coat. Follow me. How many of you are going to be repeating that several times in the morning tomorrow as you arouse your kids up and try to get them off to school? Sure, it's what it sounds like to me and uh, trying to dress a sleepy child or get dressed for school. It's what it sounds like. But Peter was obeying. Once again, Peter was outside the prison when he wakes up to the fact that God had delivered him again. God hears the prayers. God hears our prayers. Then we see that Peter starts knocking. He understands that he's outside the prison. And listen to his own testimony. He says, now I know, verse 11, for a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And then it says this, verse number 12, And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname is Mark, where many had gathered together praying. And Peter knocked on the gate, and a damsel hearkened, uh, came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood at the gate, or stood before the gate. You ever had your kids come do that? Hey, mom, somebody's knocking at the door. Well, did you answer it? No. Stranger danger. 
Okay? And uh, I think that she was a young lady, not just a little girl uh, in that. And, uh, but she said, hey, Peter, Peter's out there. He was knocking. Peter knew that the church was praying for him night and day, and he wanted to join the group uh, for a time of thanksgiving praise and prayer. The believers were gathered in the house of, of Mary, John, Mark, and, I am, uh, and I'm sure they were uh, cautious to the fact that Herod was still seeking other believers, so they kept the gate locked. But Peter patiently waited for someone as he knocked at the door. Uh, look with me as we continue to read. Uh, <clears throat> and when, uh, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate, verse 14, for gladness, but ran in and told that Peter stood at the gate. And they that, uh, and they said, and they said unto her, thou art mad. But she continually affirmed that it was even so. And they said, it's his angel. They said, oh no, Peter's gone. Or so they thought. But the whole time, the Bible says that Peter just kept knocking at the door. The believers failed to answer the door because of unbelief. That it, and that it was either Peter, uh, his angel, or his guardian angel. And finally, look at verse 16. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him. What's the next three words? And they were what? Astonished. We read a lot about people being astonished. They were surprised. Why? Because their prayer was answered. They thought, there's no way. We're praying, but he's not going to get out. Do you ever pray? You know, say, well, yeah, I'm going to pray for this, but I don't think it'll ever happen. The Bible says that we're supposed to pray believing. Now, God may not answer it the way that we want it answered, but God always answers prayer. And then we see that Peter starts declaring. Look at verse number 17. They were astonished, but he beckoning said unto them, uh, 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 excuse me, unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James, who was the brother of Jesus, the real leader of the church, and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Peter explains what the Lord had done for them. And he gave, uh, uh, and he, and he gave this uh, house church instructions. And then he departed to another place. Where did Peter go? I think that Peter probably went, since there were several house churches... I think he probably went from house to house letting people know that God had answered their prayer. I think that he, he was letting people know that God answered his prayer. But wherever he went, I'm sure that he, he just kept praising the Lord. We see that, that God uh, sees our trials. We also see that God answers our prayers. And then lastly, we see here in these last few verses that God deals with our enemies. The last part of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12 says, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So let's see how, how it all ended. <clears throat> verse number 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers of what had become of Peter. Can you imagine? I mean, just put your imagination hat on. Who you were, the guys that Peter was chained to, where did he go? Because if they would have been asleep, when Peter was asleep, they could face death for sleeping on duty. What about the two guys that were guarding the gate? And then you have the other 12 that are saying, what did you guys do with him? I mean, he was deep in the prison. He had to go from ward to ward to ward to get out. It says there was no small stir. I guarantee you there was no stone left unturned inside that prison trying to figure out where Peter got to. Because I have to believe that all the gates were still locked. And they were trying to figure out what had taken place. Look at verse number 19. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and abode there. Under Roman law, if a guard uh, allowed their prisoner to escape, they were subject to the same punishment and the prisoners uh, was to receive. All 16 guards were given the death sentence because he was, he was escaped. You think about, we'll, we'll talk about this later in the book of Acts when, when Peter is on the boat uh, off the uh, island of Malta 
and they tell the prisoners to, uh, uh, to jump in the water, the Roman guards want to kill them because if any of those people escape, they're going to have to deal with their life. Paul says, hey, don't worry about it. Nobody's escaping. He says, just, just listen to me. Just follow my instructions. But here these 16 men, because they failed in their duty uh, to keep him, ended up with a death sentence. So then we see an embarrassed king leaves. The Jews considered Jerusalem their capital, but the Romans made uh, Syria their headquarters in Palestine. And, where, and this is where uh, uh, Herod Agrippa I actually lived. But then the, uh, we're, we're let in on just a, a couple of more things. Let's look at this. Look at verse number 20. It says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and, Sy- and Sidon. And they came with one accord to him, having made uh, Blastius, uh, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desiring peace because their country was nourished uh, by the king's country. It, it doesn't explain to us what Tyre and Syrah did. They were coastal cities uh, up or close to where Lebanon and Syria are uh, today. And uh, they were free, they were self-governing, but economically they were dependent upon uh, this, this tetriarch or, or the, the lands that, uh, that Herod Agrippa I uh, had. And for some reason he was displeased with them. They had lost favor with him. And so they weren't getting the support that they needed. So like any good politician, they found a way in. They went to his chamberlain, a very trusted advisor, somebody who watched over where he slept and bribed him, made them his friends so that they could get an audience. The delegation from the region had to bribe their way into getting an audience with Herod uh, for the appeal uh, for some food. And so they, they did that through one of his trusted advisors. But then look at verse 21. So it says, then upon a, uh, And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on, on his throne, and made an orientation unto them. And the people gave shouts, saying, It is the voice of a God, not a man. And immediately the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. I did some research into this, and a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus recorded the event as follows. He said this, and I quote, On the birthday of the emperor which was upon that set day, Agrippa held a large festival which he, which he donned a robe made with silver throughout. As he entered the theater at Caesarea at daybreak, the silver glittered in the morning sunlight. And so he was so resplendent that those who looked upon him were immediately enamored with the king. Luke records for us that uh, the people gave shout and said, it is the voice of a God, not of man. Josephus says uh, that the people invoked a cry when they saw him in this shining garment and he started speaking. Now remember, these people were trying to buy favor with the king. And they, they, they made this statement. This is what he said, and I quote. He said, be gracious unto us. Hereunto we have reverenced thee as a man, but henceforth we acknowledge thee Uh, to be more than mortal nature. In other words, they said, you're a God by the outfit that he had on and by whatever he said. But here, this same king that wanted to, who killed James and wanted to put Peter to death, got all full of himself and God says, I'll take care of you. Gave him an intestinal disease, and according to the historian, it took him five days to die as the worms ate him from the inside out. I remember when I was going through EMT school, when I was a hospital corpsman, watching an autopsy. And they pulled this big old long worm out of this kid that had been shot. I had heard of those things, but I'd never seen one. It was gross. It was gross. I couldn't imagine being eaten from the inside out. But he didn't give glory to God. And in the end, what did the verse say? But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Herod relished in being called a God, and he did not deny it. Therefore, the Lord judged him. In Isaiah chapter 42, in verse number 8, it says this. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise 
to graven images. He paid the price. He paid the price. Herod was struck immediately and he died five days later. But yet the church continued. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Why? Because the church prayed. Because the church prayed. Just imagine what Cornerstone Baptist Church can do if all of us put into practice praying for God's will for our lives and for the lives of our fellow members. Just imagine what God could do. The church grew. And then we're told in verse 25, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they uh, fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname is Mark. Now the end of chapter 11, verses 29 and 30 read this way. And the disciples... Every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren that dwelt in Judea, which they did and sent it uh, to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. That was the ministry that they were on. So all of this stuff was taking place while Barnabas and Saul were ministering to the church there in Jerusalem. The death of James, the arrest of Peter, the death of Herod Agrippa, but that was up in Caesarea. At the beginning of Acts 12, Herod seems to be in control and the church was losing the battle. But at the end of the chapter, Herod is dead and the church is very much alive and growing rapidly. The secret, they were a praying church. They were a praying church. If you've never been a part of a church start, boy, there's a lot of prayer meetings that go on. We had the privilege of being part of a church start when we were in the military and then getting to go back there for a couple of years and working side by side with the pastor in that church, there's a lot of prayer that goes on. But sometimes you notice that once people get into buildings and they get comfortable and they're sitting in the padded pew instead of on uh, some hard chair that they had to set up the night before the day of, all of a sudden the prayers just aren't that important. Guarantee you there are some charter members here that could tell us about some prayer meetings that happened for Cornerstone Baptist Church in order for it to be established and be here. I'm telling you, we need to get back to those days. We're in the last days. Here, the, this church here in Jerusalem, they, 10 years in, and they were still a praying church. Well, they were facing persecution. Is that, does, does God have to persecute us to get us on our knees? It's like praying for patience. How do you get patience? Trials bring patience. We need to, we need to get on our face before God. Maybe a couple of quotes. Missionary uh, Isambul Kuhn used to pray when in trouble. Quote, if this obstacle is from thee, Lord, I accept it. But if it be, uh, but if it is from Satan, I refuse him and all his works in the name of Calvary. Dr. Ralph Redpath said this, let's keep our chins up and our knees down. We're on the victory side. Think about what he's saying. Let's keep our chins up, but our knees down. We need to stay in a position of prayer. The church works when churches pray. God works when churches pray. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on his knees. One thing that we could take away from this tonight is that God sees, God hears, and God deals with with the church and with us as individuals. God sees our trials. God hears our prayers. And when we're faithful to him, God will deal with the enemy that is trying to get us down. Let's be a people in a church of prayer. That's what we could take away from chapter 12. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please.
you may be a great prayer warrior, and I, I thank God for that. But I've talked to some of the greatest prayer warriors, and they always say, you know what, I, I can always pray more. I can always pray more. Maybe we just tonight as a church and as individuals just to need, to need to make a commitment to God. Whether you do it from your seat, whether you do it down here at the altar, just make a commitment to God that, God, I want to be a person of prayer. I want to be a child of prayer. You know, one of the things that the disciples asked them because they, they witnessed the Lord Jesus praying often. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. God gave them a model to follow. But really, prayer is just talking to the Father. I can small talk with my Father on the phone or I can talk to my Father in Pueblo, Colorado on the phone. There's a difference. I have short prayers that I can give to my Lord Jesus Christ, but there are just times when I just get on my face before him and talk to him. And all of us need to do that. We need prayer so bad in our lives. Father, we just pray, God, that you'd be with us. Lord, help us to do right by you. Lord, I, I don't know which direction you took this message tonight in the hearts of the folks, but... Lord, I just pray, God, that you would help us to be a church of prayer. Lord, that you, we would pray one for another. Lord, there are so many folks here that uh, when they're in trouble, we're good about praying for them. But Lord, how about just in general or you know, about the things that we don't know? Lord, I pray, God, that you would just lay somebody on our heart for us to pray for today. Lord, before we lay our head tonight, Lord, that we would just take that time to pray for them. And if you prompt us to do it, Lord, to send them a card or a note or something saying, you know what, I'm, I'm praying for you. And uh, Lord, a lot of times we don't need to know the details of what people want us to pray for. Lord, just help us to be a people of prayer. And I, I just beg you, start that with me. For I ask this in your precious name, amen.